All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. Anthony Gregory's chilling. I'm going to be interviewing him here in a few. But right now it's Gareth Porter, ipsnews.net original dot antiwar dot com slash porter. Welcome back to the show, Gareth. How are you, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me again, Scott. Well, I'm very happy uh, to have you on the show. I'm looking. Your latest one at antiwar dot com is Pakistan's convoy halt forces U.S. to reduce tensions. And then I see that you have a brand new one here at ipsnews dot net, which will be at antiwar dot com by the time anybody hears this later on in the archive format, anyway. And that is report shows drone strikes based on scant evidence. Come on. They wouldn't just go around executing people for no reason, Gareth, would they? I, I think actually they would. But uh, let's let's take a look at the specifics of this drone strike campaign. You know, this is a this is a story that I rewrote a couple of times because I couldn't quite decide, you know, is the headline here that the CIA uh, operations people are actually carrying out these drone strikes, uh, we now know on the basis of specific evidence, with uh, the, the least uh, evidence that one can imagine uh, to show some link with uh, al-Qaeda or associated groups? Or is the story that uh, despite the propaganda that this is a, an effective tool to uh, disrupt al-Qaeda's terrorism against the homeland of the United States, this is actually a a, a program that is now targeted almost entirely on those groups that are involved in the uh, supporting the war against the U.S. and NATO in, in Afghanistan. In other words, it's no longer an anti-terrorist tool at all. It's, it has to do, it's an adjunct, basically, of the U.S. war in Afghanistan. And so, you know, both of those are uh, keys to this story, and I worked them both in. I finally decided that it's the killing with scant evidence that was the primary aspect of the story. So that's what I led with. And and really, uh, th this is a story that is keyed to a new report that was issued by something called CIVIC, uh, Civilians uh, in uh, Civilian Casualties. Um, I've, I've gotten the full extension of the organization, but uh, it's, it's a, an organization I had not heard of before, but they have done field research interviewing uh, the victims of uh, war in Pakistan, both the drone strikes campaign as well as the Pakistani military's uh, campaign against uh, the uh, Taliban, the, uh, the uh, Pakistani Taliban uh, in the Fatah region. So um, what they have done is now to uncover uh, the, the fact that uh, in a specific case, uh, in an interview that was given by one of the victims, his house was visited by some Taliban troops who asked for lunch, and being a rather um, uh, sort of pragmatic fellow, he gave them the lunch, he didn't uh, turn them away, and the next day, guess what? His house was destroyed by a missile uh, from a drone, an unmanned uh, aerial vehicle, and uh, his house was destroyed and his only son was killed. So it dramatically illustrates the point that I think people need to understand, which is that the drone strikes are based not on a targeting that is uh, founded on real intelligence, but on uh, the merest suggestion and inference that uh, because this house was visited by some people who they thought were uh, part of the enemy, that, that it was somehow connected with uh, the Taliban or al-Qaeda or some other proscribed group. Uh, and, of course, that sort of uh, principle, when applied across the board, is going to result inevitably in hundreds and hundreds of civilian dead. And well, now, is, let me uh, stop you for a yeah. second and ask you, is there such a thing as any Arab Afghan friends of Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri in Afghanistan at all? I mean... Uh, General McChrystal said, nah, maybe there's a dozen or something like that. Uh, um, what's that great reporter from the Wall Street Journal? Um, I want to say Dylan Hero, but that's not the guy I'm thinking of. I interviewed a great reporter on this show. Uh, I, his name escapes me right at the moment. Anand Gopal, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anand Gopal. And he, and he said, look, there's maybe a hundred. I think he said a hundred. Maybe he said two. But I think he said there's a hundred actual Al Qaeda on both sides of the border, and most of them are in Pakistan. And this whole thing about this being about somehow Al Qaeda and 9/11 is a bunch of crap. They're after Haqqani and and Mullah Omar's uh, friends. Yes, this is um, this is no longer about Al Qaeda at all. Uh, I mean, the, the targeting of the drone strike specifically, okay, 
began to shift in 2009, and, and mainly because uh, al-Qaeda figures were basically getting out of, uh, of North Waziristan, uh, excuse me, out of the South Waziristan, where they had been based, and were fleeing to Karachi mainly and some other cities where the United States is clearly not going to you know, launch drone strikes uh, in, in a very crowded neighborhood. Um, or at least one assumes that they won't. Who knows? Uh, in any case, the, uh, the al-Qaeda targets were obviously uh, few and far between, and they were drying up. And so what does the CIA do? They don't say, well, you know, we might as well wrap this up because there aren't any targets anymore. No, they simply shift the targets to the Haqqani network, and uh, the, the network, the organization run by um, uh, Hafiz uh, Ghul Badahur, who is a, uh, the head of a Taliban faction, a Pakistani Taliban faction, which is not interested in fighting the, the uh, Pakistani government, but rather supporting the insurgency in uh, Afghanistan. So all of the targets uh, in North Waziristan are essentially uh, geared to uh, fighting the U.S. and NATO troops. Uh, that is the target. The, the people who are being targeted are, are geared to fighting U.S. NATO troops in Afghanistan. This has become uh, essentially a, uh, a war, a drone war that is geared to, it's, it's part of the war in Afghanistan. It has nothing to do with al-Qaeda te terrorism. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, it, it's so funny the way these guys kind of split it up. We talked before I guess if you dial it back a few months, uh, we talked about the different plans, maybe even a year we talked about the different plans. Well, let's, let's try to split the Pakistani Taliban from the Afghan Taliban, or we'll switch the, the real dead-enders from those who it's just their day job, or we'll, you know, we'll split them up this way and that. And um, it reminded me, uh, I was thinking about that while you were talking, and it reminded me of Justin Romando's column from last night is about this American um, David Coleman Headley, yeah. who uh, apparently has been working for the U.S. government this whole time and is down with the, uh, was it the L.E.T. Uh, Kashmiri separatists fighting India. And, uh, and uh, Romando references a part of Obama's wars uh, by Bob Woodward, uh, court jester, um, mm -hmm. whatever you call him, court uh, courtier. Yeah. And... Uh, and he writes that that uh, some Pakistani intelligence guys they're trying to spin this all where Pakistani ISI was behind the Mumbai attack. But when you look closer, apparently uh, Hamid Karzai and um, I forget the guy's name, but he's a Pakistani general. They both believe that the CIA is actually supporting the Taliban in Pakistan because they're trying to destabilize and destroy that government so they have an excuse to invade and seize those nukes. Or maybe that, I'm, I'm kind of uh, interpreting the end of that part myself. But they're, they're basically trying to make things worse by supporting the people in uh, Pakistan that they're uh, you know, fighting in Afghanistan. Does yeah, that this sound is a very, right this at all? Is, this is a very strange story. I agree that, that this needs to be further uh, elucidated and, um, uh, and covered by the media. Uh, what we do know for absolute certainty is that the Obama administration is hyping uh, this idea that uh, there's a new level of threat uh, of, of terrorism. Uh, you know, they, they talked about the terrorist threat in Europe based in Pakistan, uh, whereas, in fact, what's really going on is that they are, are trying their damnedest to put pressure on the Pakistani government to hit the Haqqani network. I mean, that's what their real target is, the Haqqani network. That's all they care about. But so even when they say the, the Pakistani Taliban, that's overly broad. It could be that there's that they are actually uh, backing the Pakistani Taliban, it, but that ain't necessarily Haqqani and his family and his posse. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think they're backing the, Tal the Pakistani Taliban broadly, but the idea is they have agents within it, sure. Uh, that's very, very believable. Hmm. And again, I mean, that was the biggest, gnarliest terrorist attack on Earth since 9-11, that thing in Mumbai last year. Yep. All right, everybody, hold tight. It's Gareth Porter on the line. We'll be right back. All right, y'all, it's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with my pal Gareth Porter. He knows lots of things. Lots and lots of things. All right, now, look, I've 
I'm talking crazy over here, Gareth, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot about it, but, you know, talk me out of this, dude. Why shouldn't I believe that the evil, all-knowing CIA is running their enemies in Pakistan? <laughs> well, I think that it's uh, the, the idea that we would intentionally uh, try to destabilize Pakistan so we can seize their nuclear weapons is a bridge too far in terms of... Yeah, but, of you know, even, Joe Biden says in, in in Bob Woodward's book, Biden says, our, you know, this is his argument for the... Forget counterinsurgency. We'll just do counterterrorism in a narrow focus. And because our first priority is killing al-Qaeda and securing Pakistan's nuclear weapons, said the vice president. Yeah, and, and I would have to just point out the, the fundamental radical distinction between what is said to justify a policy on one hand and an objective that is pursued, uh, you know, for its own sake on the other. I mean, it's one thing to cite, you know, nuclear weapons in Pakistan as a reason for uh, a, you know, a rationale for a policy, in, in this case, in Afghanistan. It's another thing to say, yeah, we, we really would be better off if we could destabilize the Pakistani government so that the, the nukes would be up for grabs and that would give us an opportunity to then go in with our troops. Uh, believe me, there there is hardly anybody, hardly anybody, in uh, the U.S. government who would uh, even begin to say anything favorable about that kind of a policy. I mean, you know, even even people who are extremely warlike are not that warlike right now. That that is um, that that is a species of insanity that I think went out with uh, uh, Fife and and um, uh, their, that crowd. Well, you know, that guy O'Hanlon, it was back in, I guess, 07, three years ago. O'Hanlon wrote that thing yeah. with Robert Kagan in the New right, York but Times. Again, again, remember that O'Hanlon was simply justifying an increase in U.S. Uh, ground troops. That This was not a serious uh, proposal based on, you know, his being told by Army folks, yeah, we really, uh, really want to go in there with, with troops. Uh, that's our... Uh, that's our design yeah. in the future. Right, well, okay, let me ask you this. How goes the uh, counterinsurgency strategy? I was reading that book, The Good Soldiers, by David Finkel a few weeks, uh, a few months back, I guess now. And uh, it was about Iraq. And it was about uh, part of the story was that um, the lieutenant colonel had the copy of the counterinsurgency doctrine on his desk, and he cared about it a lot, and he read it every day and not, instructed all the guys out of it and all that. But by the end of the thing, it was just sitting there collecting dust, and they were right. out, just out there going on their missions, and the coin had amounted to nothing. And so I wonder, uh, now that McChrystal is gone and Petraeus is in charge, um, or more directly in charge, he already was responsible, but... Um, you know, drone strikes and, and rules of engagement and these kinds of things, are they actually still trying to change entire societies over there and build no, a nation-state? No, this, state? Is a, this is all out the window. We're talking now about a Potemkin war. I, I think it's time to really start using the term Potemkin war. I've been thinking about that for quite a while with regard to Afghanistan because there's so many features of that war that add up to uh, a, a hollow shell of a war, which is really uh, being done for the political and bureaucratic interests of those people who are insisting on continuing it, uh, not because they believe in it, not because they believe it can be done. Um, I mean, I've now spoken with uh, somebody who's back from Afghanistan who has been in touch with uh, people surrounding uh, Petraeus, people, you know, high on his staff, who's, who says that these people do not believe that this can be successful. They know perfectly well that this is a doomed enterprise. And I have to believe that uh, those people uh, have made that known to Petraeus. I think Petraeus is perfectly well aware of this. I don't think there's now anyone of any significance involved in this war who does not realize that this is a failed, uh, failed project, that everything that's being done now is uh, for superficial political purposes uh, to to uh, try to make put the best face on it before they uh, have to. Yeah, and it's, to it only them. costs the lives of little bitty children and their mothers all day, so it's not like it's a big deal or anything. That's right, and of course these people do not allow themselves to consider that factor in into their uh, into their work. This is uh, this is not part of their calculus. Of all course. right, now what about Jim Jones? Because I just made a Jim Jones joke about how the guy <laughs> leading us on this giant path of murder suicide is named Jim Jones. And, and but great. then I got an email from Jason Ditz that said, no, nah, man, don't forget, you've been out of the loop here. Jim